Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that we've been blessed. Dear Lord, thank you for this day we've been blessed to receive. Thank you for the, the studies and the learning and the messages that we're receiving. Thank you for the understanding that we are gathering from the events that are taking place around us to form a holistic picture of the tests that are appearing before us. We ask for clarity of sight to understand and comprehend the two streams of information to discern the events that are taking place and take a right stand for gender equality, our test here at the end of the world. We ask that you'll please bless and guide this, this online uh, gathering and may you receive all honour and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, my last presentation, I was focusing on Elder Tess's VESPA studies and particularly two streams of information. Um, viewing the changes, the, the strategies and the platforms that have developed over time uh, with a particular focus on left-wing media and its problems along with the cause and effect of the lack of legislation that allows for uh, disinformation and misinformation to run rampant. Uh, so we're continuing to look on into those things. These are reviews of Elder Tessa studies uh, from um, multipolar uh, vision of the left, uh, as well as um, uh, the, the previous study before that. It escapes my mind just at the moment. So back in 2018, Elders Test started looking uh, at the Midnight Cry message or presenting the Midnight Cry message, and she unfolded uh, two strains of information to us, depicted really simply as two streams, and we understood the titles at 2018 for these two streams were CNN and Fox, Fox News. So a simple understanding of a, a good stream and a bad stream of information is a great place to start. Uh, but as we continue to learn and develop, then we're required to have a, a holistic understanding of this topic so that we're not swept away with the, the flood of disinformation and misinformation that's available to us. Uh, but you can follow these streams all the way back to heaven. So if you follow them back to heaven, um, we can say that one is a correct stream and one is a false stream. So in heaven, we had Lucifer challenging the authority of God. We saw that God in the entirety of the, the Godhead was giving the, the correct message. There was only one right message and Lucifer and the angels who followed Lucifer were giving the wrong stream of information. We, we come down the history of our, our planet and we get to 2018, an elder test uses the, the same simple method to teach us because we are, we are just starting to learn. So in order for elder test to start teaching us, she tells us that CNN is a, a good source, Fox is a bad source. And she already knows that this is not completely accurate. Um, but she needs to be able to teach us and coax us, uh, direct us down a way of understanding and comprehending what we're reading and understanding in order to, to not get swept away. So we can see that a right and wrong stream works for a, a particular history. 
and for a particular application. But now as we approach our final battles, our final tests, we live in the information age and we require a better understanding of these, these two streams. What is actually correct information? Uh, if we were to draw it another way using part of Elder Parminder's studies, is he talks about a ditch being on either side of a, a path. So on either side of the path, there is uh, wrong information. And only on the path can you find the correct information. And you need to use that correct information to, to get to the destination that you're going to. The ditch will not lead you where you need to go. Uh, as we know, it falls off to the wicked world below. So we have continued to develop our understanding of information war that we see raging around us and continues to go to the end of this earth's history. So depending on your age, you'll have seen the progression that companies have made in delivering news or ads to its audience. So we're going to start focusing on, on looking back at, at past methods that companies use to disseminate inform information. And you go back far enough, and it was the radio. So radio and print were obviously the first ones. So I'll write them down. Print is obviously the first one to come along. We had print before radio. So we had newspapers, we had magazines, articles, those sorts of things come out. And they were accessible to the people, uh, to a majority of the people. It was expensive to start with. If you go back right to uh, the early parts of the Re Reformations with the printing presses, only the, the most wealthy could afford these books or prints. And then as time progresses and as uh, technology advances, it becomes easier to print and it's available to society as a whole. So shortly after, a little while after print is done, we see radio. The radio comes along and we see the advertisement and uh, information that is shared through the radio, depending on the radio station, will depend on the type of uh, stream of information you get, whether it's a country talkback radio station generally found in this section here, or whether you find something else to listen to on the radio over that would be categorized generally in this section here of CNN. So you'll understand that as we progress through history, both of these forms of communication of spreading information have not been done away with. They continue to be there. And we, as we continue forward through history, we understand that this is true of each of these scenarios. So next come along uh, was TV. So we're just listing the major, major forms of communication between uh, media companies and, and its target audience. So TV comes along with, and we have uh, the opportunity to, to visually see people presenting the news almost live, it's, it may be delayed. And in some cases uh, in the present, you'll see live TV. And what we saw was another form of communication that opened itself up and further channeled itself into these two streams, uh, sitting under Fox or CNN, depending on the TV station or program that you listen to on that station. A little bit, Later on, we come to the internet.
So like www. So the internet comes along and we see open up a, a quite a vast uh, ability to, to spread in information. And uh, with that, obviously, ability to spread information becomes, uh, comes the ability to make money off of it. So you understand that when you have print, that you have newspapers and, and those sorts of magazines and articles, the way they make money is not through selling the item itself, not to sell the newspaper for a dollar, because they don't make much money off that. The way they make their money is to charge for advertisement within these, these forms of communication. So you put an ad in the paper, it costs a lot more to put an ad in a paper than it does to buy them the paper itself. When we come down to radio, uh, I'm not sure if you've, you've ever seen it, but here in Australia, uh, you can ring up the radio and you can have ads played for your company or you can wish your family members uh, a happy birthday. It's a form of communication that's used. The same thing, you'll, you'll sell radio space or airtime to a company that will, will uh, play a prepaid, a prepaid ad. When we get to TV, we see the same thing. We see the, the increase of ads over time. TV first started out as your viewing information. And then as time progressed, we see the, the ads creep in. We see the monetization of these platforms. Uh, when we get to the internet, we, we saw the same thing, but from a much faster progression, we saw that the internet was built in with that possibility of making money very quickly. And then we come down to our current platforms that are most widely used at the moment. Uh, phones. Um, and I'll put in brackets apps um, or, or even another word you can use for this is the platforms. So each of these is still in use today and is still a form of communication to a target audience. To anyone who's listening, they're trying to spread some sort of information as well as to sell a, a product to, to those who are willing to buy. When we get down here to, to phones and apps and platforms, uh, we, we see on our phones that we have a uh, far greater access to a vast majority of different apps and platforms, news feeds, uh, and as a result, because of these two streams of information, an incorrect source of information and a correct source of information. Then as our knowledge develops, understanding that there are incorrect lines of communication within this source of information. So anytime we have a system or platform like any of these here that is used to direct the flow of information to an audience, us, the citizens of our country, whichever country we're in, then we have that, that way of making money as well. Each of these platforms has that way of making money, monetization of uh, space or time. And this is going to start playing a factor as we we start to go into these subjects. Uh, we know that controlling the flow of information is an important tool that's being used by, by people for a long period of time. Uh, you take it from the Bible, it is understanding the flow of information over a period of time. It's written in a language that is uh, the, the consensus or the culture in that period of time. We're seeing Russia is changing its, uh, its understanding or change, rewriting history. So controlling the flow of information of how they see history, particularly World War II, if you've seen any um, news articles that have been out recently. 
we've seen in the studies from other tests that America has changed the books in schools depicting the events around the Civil War. So controlling the narrative is or spreading information or disinformation comes down to these two streams of information. And what I'd like to do now is share with you a, a small graph that displays the top 10 social media um, sites or platforms that are used on the internet to communicate or spread uh, information. So we're seeing particularly focusing on um, the internet use here and phones. These aren't, uh, aren't outdated, but what you do notice with each of these is it's targeted to particular generations. The younger generations are getting their information from phones and apps and platforms. When young children are, are born, it's not too long now between uh, before you're going to see them using using their phones, being brilliant at it, uh, studying them up because it's just a culture that we we have at the moment. And as we we step back through each of these uh, periods of or types of communication, we see that the the demographic of people changes uh, and so we're focusing on particularly young people and how accessible this information is so your phone you can have anywhere and you can you can go onto these apps you can get notifications if you're not on these apps that will tell you to come back to this app um, whereas these things you have to be you have to be seated somewhere and or go and get this magazine, or you have to um, be next to a radio in order to listen. You have to be on the TV, in front of a TV to be able to see what's what's airing. And so the phones we've always got with us, uh, and it's a very clever way of, of controlling the narrative and spreading information and disinformation. So I'm going to share screen with you. Radio. What we're seeing here is a list of the top 10 uh, apps that are used for sharing uh, and disseminating information. So we've got the column down the side here, left one to 10. We've got the name of the platform that's being used. So Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp. Next to it, we've got the monthly active users. And we see right up there, Facebook being the highest um, with the uh, amount of users, uh, as well as the revenue that, that this company has. You've got the date that it was launched. Uh, and part of the interesting thing here is the headquarters. Um, so for this particular information, most of these platforms you will understand uh, or will have heard of. Twitter, we know, has been in the news a lot with Elon Musk. Uh, LinkedIn is a source for often uh, business-associated works. Reddit is, is quite uh, toxic, has been covered by um, Rachel. Uh, Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, Instagram. So these are, should be quite common. They're the top 10 um, from ratings. Over here in the headquarters stage, this is what we want to have a quick look at. Um, we're seeing Menlo Park, CA, which means California, uh, San Bruno, California. Another one for Menlo Park, Menlo Park, Culver City, Los Angeles, which is in California, Los Angeles in California, and then San Francisco and Mountain View. So what I want to do now is scroll down and show you the proximity of these. These are all around the area of Silicon Valley, with the exception of these two that have asterisks next to them. So I'll scroll down just a little. 
So this is a picture of Google Maps. Up in the top left corner here, I have just added destinations of those, those points that we were just reading off the headquarters. And then down on the map here, we can see the Silicon Valley uh, and the directions that we take. Each of these locations is really close to each other within walking distance for most of them. Um, then we've got Menlo Park and San Bruno are, are not too far away. And if you're if you're good with geography, you'll understand that um, Los Angeles is a little further south to south of the West Coast in in the USA. So why why is that uh, in, important to us? Why why does that make a difference of why these top ten places are these top ten apps? are uh, all in the same place for their headquarters. So just a, a breakdown of some general information from the Business Harvard Review. Similar markets and industries tend to become concentrated in a particular area. For example, competing bookstores are often in close proximity in a city. Dedicated marketplaces exist for groceries and malls have different branded clothing shops lined up sequentially. Why do competitors line up next to each other in close proximity? Because people prefer a variety of choices, and this applies to consumers, workers, entrepreneurs, and business people. It is easy to build infrastructure facilitating similar businesses. So each of these businesses requires good internet. It requires good people to be able to sustain and keep running these platforms, uh, Twitter, YouTube, all those all those different platforms. And when you've got them all together in one location, it helps because you're building the same infrastructure around uh, the services that they require. Another reason is joint uh, industry strength. So combined industries in close proximity can jointly lobby for certain benefits. Lobbying the government to increase the cap of foreign employee visas, requesting a dedicated transport facility uh, from nearby suburbs, sharing common service providers for employees, uh, joining hands for charitable causes uh, are a few of the benefits of co-location, which offer advantages to te te technology businesses in Silicon Valley. And the last quote for the moment, over the last 20 years, uh, and, and probably one of the very good reasons why we're seeing each of these companies have their headquarters in California, uh, is referring to this quote, over the last 20 years, Silicon Valley has benefited from a once in a lifetime alignment of advantages, uh, American primacy, the ubiquity of cheap capital, the arrival of the smartphone along, uh, among other widely adopted tech innovations, and perhaps most significantly is a benign regulatory environment have all conspired to create a historic concentration of wealth and power. The titans of the valley and their heirs have been free to roam far ahead of lawmakers, watchdogs, and tax codes. So I'll stop sharing there. Oops, sorry, I've uh, made a mistake here. That's my paper drawn. So we're seeing that there, there's lots of different reasons why the tech companies are having their, their headquarters in one location. We know from Elder Test that these platforms, most of these platforms were, were created with good intentions, but some had bad intentions, particularly Facebook was very toxic the way it started. Uh, but most of them are just useful tools uh, to benefit our lives. 
but like any tool, uh, it can be used for good purposes or it can be used for bad purposes. So because information technology has launched uh, at such a, a, an Excel grade as we saw in that previous quote, it's such a fast pace that laws have not been able to keep up with the, the progress of technology. Um, particularly if you look now, what's relevant is AI and the concern that they, uh, people have around artificial intelligence and the impact that that is having on society, particularly because there are no rules to govern the use um, or misuse of this, this new um, technology within society. So why am I here talking about social media apps? Uh, these are the, the form of information that we receive. These being most prevalent and these ones being uh, most susceptible to, um, to, to be highly impactful to the audience or the target audience. So for each of us, on our phones, we've always got our phones, we're always being targeted by specific ads or, or, uh, or media narrative. Um, that's not to say that we throw away our phones and stop using them, not at all. It just is to be aware of the fact that we are being bombarded by these, these apps. So we're looking at a, a a prophetic critique of the left. And what we'll know is that Silicon Valley is, is within California and all those headquarters that we saw there are within the state of California in America. And within that state, it is known to be uh, a blue state or a democratic state. And a lot of the people who are in in control of these, these tech companies, particularly within Silicon Valley, are your left-leaning, uh, we would say, liberal democratic voting people. But we understand that within these two streams of information, this has flaws as well. If we were to put um, liberal and conservative, within these two streams. We understand that for us within the movement, we know not to go near this information. We know that it's wrong. Within this stream of information, we need to dissect carefully what's what we're ingesting and taking and, and believing as fact, because it's not all right. So this is where part of the reason why disinformation and misinformation is so prevalent is because these these apps and platforms are not being restricted enough and particularly when you take into account in america the first amendment that they have and the way that they use that uh, is is creating this this idea of freedom of speech to say and whatever you want no matter the harm that it causes So I'm going to share screen with you again, and we're going to look at the quote that Elder Tess referred to in Prophetic Critique of the Left. And it's a, a lengthy article about a reporter who spends a lot of time with Steve Bannon. Uh, and there's just one little passage there that I would like to pull out from this article for us. I uh, will share that with you. So this reporter was Graham, are you able to make it a bit bigger at all? I will try. Sorry to interrupt. No, don't be sorry. Is that getting any better or would you like the text to be bigger? 
it, it was just the text that was hard to read, but if, if it's um, possible. All things are possible. Just whether I can do them or not is another thing. Is that better? Yeah, that's improved. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, this reporter is spending a lot of time with Steve Bannon um, months. Uh, and as Elder Tess points out, the reporter actually goes, is invited by Steve Bannon to visit um, or attend to the funeral of Steve, Bannon, Steve Bannon's father when, when he died. So they have a, a, a working relationship. Steve Bannon knows that the reporter works for a particular outlet that he does not agree with, but he is one of the one of the people who will go on to any any site, whether it's uh, conservative or whether it's liberal, and 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 pour out his thoughts and his beliefs, because he understands that when he's on that platform, when he's on the left wing platform disseminating disinformation or misinformation then it's still getting traction any any publicity is good publicity for steve bannon so we'll have a look at the the article and what it's referring to so steve bannon is recalling his hong kong days in the 2000s when he was working for internet gaming entertainment he notes how stunned he was to discover how many people played multiplayer online games and how intensely they played them but then he breaks it down for morris using the example of a theoretical man named dave in accounts payable who one day drops dead so dave is a is an example that he's going to use of a person who plays a game dave works in accounts payable but dave also plays a game some preacher from the church or some guy from a funeral home who's never met him does a 10-minute eulogy. He says a few prayers, Bannon says, and that's Dave. That's it for Dave's life. It's all over. But that's offline Dave. Online Dave is a whole other story. Dave in the game is Ajax, Bannon continues. And Ajax is like the man. So Ajax, you know, this wonderful person in the game. Not wonderful in the terms of gender equality, but he's wonderful at playing the game or he's powerful or is far advanced. Ajax gets uh, a caisson when he dies and is carried off to a raging uh, funeral pyre. The rival group comes out and attacks and there's literally thousands of people there. Bannon says, people are home playing the game and the guys are not going to work and the women are not going to work because it's Ajax. And he asks the question, who's more real? Bannon says, Dave in accounting or Ajax? So that that information that you saw there in the in the previous paragraph, if someone dies within a game and they're very influential, they are given all sorts of the game developers create things in that game to give that person uh, some sort of send-off or or to acknowledge their existence and their their input into the game. Ajax Bannon realised uh, some people, particularly disaffected men, actively prefer and better identify with the online versions of themselves. He kept this top of mind when he took over Breitbart News in 2012 and he decided to build out the comment section. This became more of a community than the city they live in the town that they live in or the old bowling league, he tells Morris. Uh, I bolded the next section. The key to these sites was the comment section. This could be weaponized at some point in time. The angry voices pro uh, probably directed, properly directed, have latent political power. again. So Steve Bannon understands that this group, this group of people playing this game have, have potential for, for great political power if used in the right way, if used in his way. He understands how they're thinking and how, how to best access these people. 
Now, what we're seeing in the platforms and what is no different to, to the games is that these are methods of communication between people online. Each of the social media apps that are, were listed before, the 10 sites, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, um, all, all those top monthly performers are a form of communication between people. So it's like a comment section. You're, you're creating comments. If you recall uh, last, last presentation I did, I spoke of some comparisons of one of the conservative broadcasters that we had on TV, Tucker Carlson, um, and showed that even in court, the court didn't acknowledge that he was a reporter because some of the battles that, that Tucker Carlson fought in court, he was listed as a, a social media commentator uh, or an opinionist. He gave his opinion and then because it's his opinion under his First Amendments, he's not able to be held liable for those opinions. That's not always the case, as we saw with Dominion um, and the, the backlash against that. So as early back as 2000s, when Steve Bannon's in the gaming industry, he, he understands the potential of this weapon or what's not made as a weapon, but what would be used, weaponized. So back in the early 2000s, gaming wasn't online gaming or MMOs massive multiplayer online were not as prevalent as they are today. And so you didn't have as many people playing those games and it wasn't as widely accepted. Uh, but now as we, we come down to our current age, most people, most uh, males, I will say, are playing some form of game. Um, and so each of those games has within it a method of communication, particularly in the gaming world, Reddit is popular. This is a uh, another uh, the topic that that Rachel has um, covered really well for us as well, talking about Reddit and how that works, and how ideas and theories are pushed forward, and and the more times they view, the the higher and higher the view count is. So one of the biggest draw cards to these games is that ability to communicate with people. The, um, the, the bringing together of, of individuals from all over the world uh, into, into a group or I can't remember what they call guild or a, a team. Um, And then this, this spews over into the online Reddit forms. It comes over into YouTube and across each of these apps. So the conservative right has successfully empowered and emboldened individuals and the social groups that they represent to live the life that they have in the gaming world. So what these phones and apps are, uh, allow you to do particularly in America is to say whatever you want. The, the weaponization of these, these games is to take the comments to give the people a strength, a sense of strength to say whatever they want on these platforms that spreads worldwide to, to people who view them. And this is the weaponization. And it doesn't matter how sexist they are, how vile they are, they're, they're finding the courage to say them because they they understand that their First Amendment rights protect them. Other countries have uh, stricter, stricter laws, particularly Australia. And we'll, we'll take a look at that and how this slows down some of that hate speech that we see. 
I'm going to uh, share screen with you again. We'll go down to the next quote that we're looking at. I'll just make this a bit bigger as well. So opening the floodgates to dissemination. Um, this is an article from The Guardian. Increasing misinformation on so social media platforms, scaling, con uh, scaling back content moderation and the rise of AI are converge uh, converging to create a perfect storm for the 2024 elections that some ex experts warn could put democracy at risk. So uh, this article is going on to explain how these platforms that we're looking at made some changes in years past, in recent years, after the election of Donald Trump and the misinformation and the January 6th insurrection. They banned some accounts to stop them from being able to share disinformation and misinformation. Now what some of these companies are doing are reversing those effects that were put in place, allowing these people like Donald Trump, like Steve Bannon, and others to come back online and continue sharing disinformation and misinformation through those platforms. YouTube this week, uh, referring to this week, it was about the start of June 2023, I believe. Uh, this week reversed its election integrity policy, allowing content contesting the validity of the 2020 elections to remain on the platform. Meta, meanwhile, reinstated the Instagram account of uh, misinformation super spreader Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and will allow Donald Trump to post again imminently. Twitter has also allowed Trump to return and has generally seen a rise in the spread of misinformation since billionaire Elon Musk took over the platform last year. These trends may prove disastrous for the 2024 elections and for the health of democracy at large, said Imran Ahmed, Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for Countering Digital Hate. So we're seeing these companies, these platforms, allow access back to the people who are uh, sharing disinformation and misinformation and allowing, allowing them to continue to spread that stuff, especially with the supposed defrauding of the 2020 election and it, Trump and saying how it was rigged, um, which poses great problems. YouTube this week reversed a policy banning content that cast doubt on previous election results, specifically that uh, the platform will no longer remove content that advances false claims that widespread fraud errors or glitches occurred in the 2020 and other past US presidential elections. The policy was instituted in December of 2020 uh, when Trump and his supporters sought to delegitimize the election results, a narrative that culminated in the storming of the US Capitol on January 6. Under the rules, prominent accounts, including that of right-wing former ha White House strategist Steve Bannon were banned. Election disinformation is particularly harmful on YouTube as its algorithms often suggest related videos to users, further skewing their views. One report found that users already skeptical of election results were served three times as many election denial videos as those who were not. YouTube declined to comment for this study. So, if you go onto a site and you view a particular source of information, like this article is stating, if you already had doubts over the election and you looked into other sites that spoke of those doubts of the US election being legitimate, you received three times as many uh, other documents stating the falsehood of the legitimacy of the election. So they were election denies. Now, 
if you go onto sites and you're looking for information and you come across uh, part good information, part bad information, you will be filtered because of those algorithms, other pieces, potentially other pieces of bad information. And this is the problem that we're seeing within these platforms. YouTube's argument for open discussion is one that has come to sound familiar in recent months. It is the centerpiece in the reasoning for the new Twitter boss, Elon Musk, who has called himself a free speech absolutist when it comes to reinstating previously banned accounts. My concern is that there will be whole groups of people who become so disenfranchised that they don't vote at all, she said. If you think your vote doesn't matter because of misinformation and disinformation and you don't vote, democracy dies. So I'll stop sharing there. We understand that democracy is not a perfect system, that it is the best of what we, we believe it's the best of what we currently have available to us. Um, but we can see the perplexities in these, these tech companies, particularly these ones here that I'm focusing on, which are located in Silicon Valley, said to be a left-leaning area, um, but then continuing to use this freedom of speech for people to be able to say whatever they want. Uh, we understand how our two opposing sides of equality over freedom. And then compared with a conservative, which has freedom over equality. And now the, the problems that we have when we have um, conservative people taking control of, of some of these platforms. So we're looking at Elon Musk taking control of Twitter, one of the top, I think it was number 10 on the listing of these apps for monthly users. Uh, and then other liberal minded people who continue to push for freedom over equality. And we're seeing that downfall of that left-wing media uh, failing, failing its people. So we're approaching 2024. 2024, we're going to have the election of the United States, as the article mentioned, uh, as well as if you go into Google, have a look at all the other countries that are going to go through a presidential election or a major election coming up, not just for your local party members, but also, uh, you know, a countrywide major effect where a change of leadership will will bring uh, drastic change. And there is a lot of countries out there that are, are going through this change, particularly within the continent of Africa. Um, there's some countries within the realm of uh, Asia. The United States is going through it along with uh, the South America's region. Uh, and there's uh, some countries in Europe as well. So 2024, we're seeing the elections of, of quite a lot of companies, uh, countries, taking place. We're seeing phones, uh, apps and the internet not, um, not putting any checks or balances on what can be spoken of, uh, what disinformation or information or, or misinformation is spread. And then we have the influence of different countries coming together trying to to influence in their way uh, another country's democracy so we'll see russia coming in and and tampering with elections we'll see 
America tampering with election cycles in terms of uh, using these platforms to, to spread information, which we saw and which I would attest uh, presented for us with Cambridge Analytica, uh, Steve Bannon being a part of that, um, and, and many other key players as well. So 2024 is going to be an interesting year, but not in a particularly good way. Uh, I'm going to share another document with you. No, I'm not. I didn't add it in. Sorry, one moment. Um, so, as a, well, for me personally, I understand that the final test that is is coming upon us, or test plural, is is not the same law that is being passed in every country, like we used to think it was for the Sunday law. So traditional Adventist understanding is that the Sunday law is passed in the United States and then starts to work its way around the different countries uh, where it's, it's fully installed. And I don't believe that we, we see that as being the events that is taking place for us here with our understanding of the way the world is working. Um, there was a particular article, and I don't know why I haven't got it there. What the article is talking about is that Australia, the Washington Post uh, presented an article where Australia is one of the nations who is using its current laws and processes to hinder Twitter. So uh, I think it was the High Commission has sent out a, a message to, to Elon Musk at Twitter and is saying, we're holding you accountable for these hate crimes that are coming up on your feed, uh, on your Twitter site, in particular, focusing on Uh, the referendum that we're having later this this year. So with the referendum that we have with the First Nations having a, a community that votes um, and, and comes together to decide Indigenous matters, um, there's been a, quite a, a big backlash within the universe of Twitter and that the hate crimes that are coming out of that are, are being addressed by... Uh, legal entity within Australia. And so they're potentially able to fine Elon Musk, uh, I think it's about $400,000 a day. And so this is not something that he can, Elon Musk can ignore. This is something that he has to, um, has to respond to. So I'm sorry, I've copied over that or deleted that or oh no I found it didn't scroll down low enough I will share screen Um, Washington Post article, Melbourne, Australia. Australia has ordered Twitter to explain what it is doing to tackle online hate, saying there had been a sharp increase in toxicity and hate since Elon Musk took over the company last year. Twitter could be fined as much as $475,000 a day if it doesn't comply 
under an online safety law that Australia touted as a world first when it was introduced in 2021. Julia Inman Grant, Australia's e-safety commissioner and a former Twitter executive said Thursday that she issued the notice after a worrying surge of hate online and specifically a sharp increase in reports of serious online abuse since Musk bought the company in October. Twitter appears to have dropped the ball on tackling hate, Inman Grant said in a statement on Thursday. She worked at Twitter as Director for Public Policy in Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia between 2014 and 2016. Twitter has 28 days to respond to the notice. The company responded to an emailed request for comment with a smiling poop emoji. It's automatic response to media inquiries since the Musk takeover. So if you're not aware, if any news outlet contacts Elon Musk at, at Twitter, he just sends back the smiling poop emoji and completely ignores. Inman Grant said a third of all complaints about online hate reported to the eSafety Commission are now from Twitter. So one third. And if you noticed in that previous, uh, previous graph that I showed you, Twitter was ranked number 10 and quite small in comparison to the others and yet contains one third of the uh, degenerated complaints over the past 12 months. And obviously a direct correlation between Elon Musk taking over Twitter. She singled out as particularly problematic Musk's decision in November to reinstate tens of thousands of accounts that had been banned or suspended under previous leadership as a potential factor in increased hate speech. The commission received reports that the reinstatement emboldened extreme polarizers, peddlers of outrage and hate, including neo-Nazis, both in Australia and overseas. Um, the Australian Electoral Commissioner, Tom Rogers, told the Washington Post in January that he had been taken aback by vitriolic attacks on the platform ahead of the constitutional referendum planned for later this year on whether an elected advisory body to parliament for Indigenous Australians should be established. So uh, this particular article, just wanting to focus on the changes that Australia are trying to make, that different countries are trying to make to combat uh, the spread of, of particularly hate speech, sexism, uh, misogyny that we're seeing, that we understand to be our test. Um, as we are living in these final days. Um, so the, the laws that are passed in one country will not be passed in, in, in each of the subsequent countries around the world, but we're going to see this continual decay of equality, particularly gender equality, it's always the first affected, by these laws that are chained within different countries and by the culture that is allowed to flourish within those within those countries. So just to, to wrap up and to review, we've been looking at two streams of information, focusing on uh, liberal and conservative information. At a basic look, one can be right, one can be wrong. As Elder Tess has taught clearly that the liberal side of information has a lot of flaws and we need to be careful when sifting this information. The idea that these, that is supposed to surround the, the liberal or definitely for um, radical feminism is that equality trumps bad work. Equality is greater than freedom. So the equality of the people is greater than the individual freedom of that person to say what they want. And we understand that the polar opposite is, is true for the Conservative Party. Both forms of media, both liberal and conservative, use all of these platforms to spread a to spread their information, um, which can be disinformation or misinformation, or it can be factual. And what we're seeing within these apps 
within these platforms, these social media platforms, is the monetization of views. When you go onto YouTube and you watch a video, that person who uploaded that video gets a certain amount of money. Let's say they get a dollar. They don't get a dollar, but let's say they get a dollar. It doesn't matter if that uh, information is true or false. They get a, a dollar for it. But out of that dollar, YouTube also gets a cut as well. And this happens, this is a very basic way of explaining it. This happens with all of those platforms. They sell ads on those those sites. So these, these liberals who are running the platforms and the apps, not all of them are liberal, but some of them are, are allowing for money to, to influence the culture and to influence what is said online and, and offline, which is corrupting the information and particularly for uh, younger people who receive this information. They are bombarded with disinformation and misinformation. So the, the focus was to look at look at these two groups that are using these platforms the same way and understand how they're using them and, and the challenges that creates for the country and for individuals who are on the receiving end of that, that hate speech. It also kills off good media, good uh, journalists, journalistic media. Um, we're seeing a rapid rise in the amount of people who start as, as good journalists and then end up speaking the, the kind of information that you, you would identify with the conservative party, with the, the conspiracy theories and misinformation. We will close there. Uh, if you're able to, would you like to kneel with me? We'll close in prayer and then we'll have some questions afterwards. Dear Lord, thank you for this day that you're blessed us to receive. Thank you for the platforms that we have available to us. We understand through WhatsApp we are able to communicate within this movement clearly and concisely and quickly. We understand that these tools are also used for the wrong reasons. We ask for clarity of sight and mind to understand the information that we're reading, to understand the implications that it has on us as citizens in a society and the impact that it has to gender equality. Our test, we ask that you will bless Brendan as he uh, gets up to, to speak next and may we receive the rich blessings that you have for us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.